speaking of, of uh, uh, Matthew chapter 24, how it talks about earthquakes. But then when you go into Revelations, there's more of not just earthquake. Then there's meteors that are coming down, raining down from from heaven and creating more devastation and more killings. I mean, it's just a, it's it's just the uh, the idea of thinking that we are talking about this new uh, the series that we started last week is called the end. Last week we talked about the resur. I mean to the. Uh, um, Rapture. <laughs> it was right there. R. Well, the R word. I was going to say resurrection. No, that was what Jesus did. You know. So in the rapture of, of the Christian uh, followers of Jesus Christ being caught up in 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 and going with Jesus up into heaven. You know. And then next week we're going to look at some more in depth of kind of maybe some of of how things are going to happen, but more in depth of of what's going to happen in uh, maybe of the best chronological logical or or timeline as my personal opinion of how it's going to go down, of how I'm reading the uh, revelations in that. But this week we're going to talk about the end um, as in your end. Uh, a lot of times what we forget about or what we don't want to talk about is our own personal end. We just want to think that we're kind of immortal and we're going to live forever. You know, and reality is that we all, if the Lord tarries, we are going to pass away. Uh, it's the idea of saying that, that what's going to happen when it's your time and your number is up and it's time for you to leave this earth where or what is going to happen at your end? Hmm, that's deep. Okay, but we're going to look at some interesting things uh, that the Word of God says. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to start off in Revelation chapter 22, verses 12 and 13. It says here, it says, I, Behold, I am coming. This is Jesus speaking, okay? It says, Behold, I am coming. My reward is with me. Oh, that's a pretty interesting thought. Jesus is coming and he has rewards with him. Hmm. Hmm. Something to think about. Something may say, hmm. Everybody go, hmm. Yes, okay. And I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. If you came on uh, Sunday night Bible studies, what was the Alpha and the Omega? What is that? It's the, it's, the, it's the alphabet, the Greek alphabet, the beginning letter and the end letter. So again, is, is God's recommend, He's just giving that understanding. Jesus is giving that, that He is, he is telling everyone He is... He's, every, he, he's that. All of that. All of that. So in that, but what I want to look at here, here is what Jesus is saying, that we are going to be, as Christians, we are going to be rewarded when we go to heaven. Now, I don't want you to get this misunderstood here, because what I want to do is I'll give you a little example, okay? That a lot of people, they, they misunderstand the uh, getting to heaven part. That I got to be good enough, or I got to give to the church, or I got to be a part of this. I got to do, give, give, get like that, and that—that's what makes me get to heaven. But we're going to clear that up, then, because that is not true, okay? But it's kind of maybe like this example as Christians, you know, that that we're going to be rewarded when we get to heaven. All right. So there's this pastor and this taxi driver. Okay, they both die, and they go to the the heaven's gates, and there's Saint Peter standing there at the gates. He's going, "Hey, what's going on?" Pastor, what's going on, taxi driver? What? Come on in, man. Let's take a little. Tr this is over here. This is Jesus is up over there. You know, over here is where the, the angels are hanging out over here. All right, let me take you to the new place that you're going to be staying at. Okay, come on over here, Pastor. This is your new home. It's a two bedroom, one bath. Okay, you got a fenced in backyard. It's really nice, really nice, re really nice. And he goes, All right, taxi driver over here, this is your seven bedroom, five bath with overlooking the, the uh, heavenly greens golf course. And, and all of that, this is all in the, sw in the ground swimming pool. This is yours. And the pastor's going, What? 
that's crazy. Why is he getting such a big old place like that? And I get this little old, it's nice, don't get me wrong, it's nice, but why do I get this little thing right here? I have served Jesus all my life. He's being really dramatic, you know, because you know how preachers are. They just get all, get all using their hands, getting excited like that. And all of a sudden, St. Peter's looks at him and goes, listen, I understand what you're saying, but, you know, it's all on the concept of what you did, why you was on earth. But see, pastor, when you was on earth, when you preached, people slept. But when people would ride with the taxi driver, they all prayed, Lord, get me to my destination. Oh. <laughs> so on that concept of what happened there on earth, you know, it's like he gets this, you know. And so we're looking at some things in life that when we go to, when we go to heaven, the reality is we will be judged before Jesus on what we did while we were here on our earth. Some people were, you know, it's just like they're, they're just scooting by, you know, with just salvation. And God's called us, you know, listen, I, I want to reward you. I want to give you things. I don't know about you. When I was a kid, I loved it when I did something right and somebody gave me something. You know, I, I just love that kind of stuff. But so what we're going to look at is that when we die as Christians, we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ. Um, what we're going to look at is the scripture here. Um, this theologians, ha they kind of think of this time as it's going to happen after the rapture. This is what they're, they're in their theology of how they study and look at things. This judgment will happen after the rapture is what they're thinking. Okay, so um, it, I'm still kind of out to lunch on that one. Okay, I'm, you know, but it's still no matter what the judgment seat of Christ is going to happen. When? Mm, still not on that, but it's going to happen. So let's look at some verses about this, okay? In Luke chapter 14, verse 14, it says, Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. And what this is really telling me is that sometimes in life we do things on the motive that somebody's going to pay us back. Almost every one of us do things with a motive. Okay, 99.9% .9 of us do things with a motive. We're going to do this, and they're going to pay me back, or I'm going to get this from them. It's the only reason I'm doing it. But in this scripture, what it's saying is that do things to people or for people or, or in something after, or maybe for and expecting nothing back because one day you're going to stand before Jesus and Jesus is going to give you, you know what, you did this and your heart was right and you did it all for the right reasons and I saw it and I'm going to give you this. And, he, and in this judgment time, He's giving you something good and you were not expecting it. And that's the Jesus that is absolutely awesome to be able to stand before Him. But in that, He's going to say, you know what, I remember this day. Because again, remember, He's always looking at the intent of the heart. If you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you commit adultery with her in your heart. So when you're doing something good to somebody, is the intent in your heart with motive of just I, I just got to do I just got to do this nice thing and not expect anything back, or do I'm doing this so I can get you know in teenagers they're they're big about this I'm going to clean my room and clean the house and next thing you know they're coming up there, um, can I go to this party or can I go to so and so's house you know and all, and, and all of it was that they just did that intent and in knowing that they can get something out of it. Other than that, if they would just come to the, to the parent and ask, well, can I go to the, to the store? Can I go to, to this party? You know, and not have nothing done. You know, the answer is going to be no. You know, so their, their intent of what they're doing is all on motivation of getting something back. And here Jesus is saying, you know, hey, do it without expecting to be repaid. Now, in, in, in the more look at this, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, it says this. It says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. 
So here's what it is. Jesus is pretty much being straight to the point of saying, listen, you're going to be judged on whatever you did, good or bad, and you're going to get something for it. Well, I don't know about you. Whenever I did something bad at my house, my daddy gave me a, tore my butt up. That's what I got, you know? So I, I, I don't even want to look Jesus in the eye and be reprimanded by him. I don't. So in that, and my motivation is, okay, what will honor him and what I do, and no one expect anything back. Uh, okay, you know, uh, me, my, my biggest thing is money. You know, I do not like lending money when somebody says they're going to pay me back. You know, but now in the aspects of it is to say, okay, God, they need money. They need help with it. I'm going to lend them the money as a seed and that they're not probably going to pay me back because I just, that's the way it happens. And then that I'm trusting you, God, that you will bring salvation or whatever help is needed in that. And that'll be a part of, uh, of honoring you. Expecting nothing back. I'm going to lend them this money, expecting nothing back. And then that, but in this word, judgment seat, um, it, it, it's really kind of interesting. This word here is for those that like to do the studies and the breakdowns of words. Okay, this word, um, judgment seat, in the Greek means it, it's a bema. It's a bema seat. Okay, it's, it's the seat of. Um, Back in the day, let's say, let's go back to the Olympics of way back when that there was like, uh, let's say Caesar, you know, he was the king or he was the royal man uh, in charge, you know, and they would do these games. He would sit at this seat with authority and he would give out the rewards. So Jesus is going to be sitting at this throne, this seat, and it's not the throne of judgment of um, you're condemned, you're bad, you're sentenced to life imprisonment. No, this is a, a, a seat of rewards of of giving good to you uh, of what you deserve. Okay, so that's what this this uh, um, this this judgment seat in the Greek word is a bema seat. It is it actually is the the giving of reward seat. So it's that that is um, mm -hmm. um, it, it, it kind of reminds me of back when I used to I, I love to run I love to play basketball and you know get into some tournaments I remember being in some basketball tournaments when I was younger you know and then you would just you would, you get to the I, you know, I think we only I only was a part of one winning team on the basketball but I did was always able to get into like second or third place bef many many times but never could never finish all the way but one time but it steals the idea when at the end of the tournament. You would be able to stand before the one person who was in charge of everything and then you received the trophy for what you did. You know, and then that one time I remember receiving the, uh, the, uh, the, the most valuable player trophy and I received that most valuable player. And then that, but it took work to get that and things, to, you know, and the practice to do that. And so it's the things of, of that when we stand before God, He is going to give us gifts for what we have done here. Now, I'm sure there's probably many kind of gifts that God's going to give us, Jesus is going to give us when we get there about some things. But here are five that I know that are listed that we're going to talk about. Okay? There's five different crowns that God is going, and Jesus is going to give us when we stand before Him. Okay? The possibility of getting the incorruptible crown. This is running the faithful race. This is being able to say, I, everything that Jesus taught me, I changed and I followed him on that. Because there's so many Christians that go to church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and they hear the Word of God teaching them uh, about how they're to behave as followers of Jesus Christ and they go Monday morning and they put all that back in their little uh, 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 memory or back in the Bible and their writings and they do not follow Jesus' writings of teaching them how to behave as Christians. But those that do and try, at least they're trying, will receive this crown, the incorruptible crown that Jesus will give them. Then there's the, the crown of rejoicing, sharing their faith. 
There's those that we're going to, you're going to get a crown for the attempt, the attempt of trying to share your faith. I, I was just watching this video the other day. It was really cool. Five years ago, I remember going through this program. Um, it was uh, uh, through Kirk Cameron and how he was uh, d um, he was going out in the streets and he was sharing the gospel. And the first he would do is he would he would introduce them first to the law and how they they have sinned against God. And then he would bring in the 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 gospel of what Jesus did for him. And he got up to these gang members one time and he started talking to them about Jesus. And this one dude, he, he was like, maybe he was drunk or high or something like that, but he was always trying to throw in something negative to Kurt and about this. And, and, and But he still shared the gospel. He planted the seed of salvation there. The guy didn't get saved then. But five years later, these other group of guys were in that same territory videotaping and sharing the gospel. And all of a sudden, the guy saw... It looked like the same guy on the video that Kirk was talking about. And he's over there holding his Bible on the sidewalk, sharing Jesus with people walking by. And he calls up Kirk, because the guy knew Kirk. And he's like, hey man, you remember this video you know, we did back in five years ago? Remember that guy that gave you such a hard time? He didn't have no shirt on. He looked like he's like sunburned around his neck. He's over there right now. I promise you. And he, and he says, I'm going to send you a picture. And I'm going to uh, verify that this is the dude. Sent, takes a picture and texts it to him. And, and, and Kirk's like, that's the guy. That's the guy. He goes, I'm going to go over there and talk to him. And he goes over there and he starts talking to him. And he, he shows a picture to this guy of Kirk. He goes, remember this guy? He, he, he shared the gospel about five years ago with you. He goes, and all of a sudden the guy just start telling his testimony about what God did in his life and how he got saved. And he's never been the same since. And he just can't, he has to share Jesus' love with so many others. You know, and it's the idea sometimes it's not us that is gonna, uh, that's going to lead them to Christ. But it's the idea of us planting the seeds and, and hoping that maybe God will bring another one to harvest it. You know, but again, it receives that God brings, He's the one that brings salvation. He's the one that does it. He waters the plants. He does all this other stuff on the side. But it's our part and our part of saying, you know what? I, I got to tell them a little bit about Jesus. Or I got to give them a little gospel track. Or I got to invite them to church. Or I got to, you know, I, I'm doing these things in, in, in following and planting that Jesus will save them from their sins and doing your part and you will receive the, the, the crown of rejoicing how cool would it be to be standing there and God gives you that thing there? You know, and all of a sudden then there's the, the crown of righteousness. There's his, it, love His returning. You're, you're so in love. You're always excited about Jesus is coming back. He's going he's gonna to come back and get us. You know, that, that, that excitement to share with others and, and holding it dear into your heart that you believe that He's coming back. Then there's the crown of glory. That's for... Now you got it. It's for the preachers. You find that in 1 Peter 5, 2 through 5. Yes, yes. As those that, that want to preach His Word and tell the Gospel and looking to seek God to, to grow people around them. I can't wait to get that one. That one's going to be really cool. It's going to purdy. It's going to have all these little jewelry things on there, sparklies. It's going to bedazzle. Is that what you call it? Bedazzle. It's going to be a bedazzled crown. Yeah, yeah. And then, then there's the crown of life. The crown of life. Those who suffered because of Jesus. Now I know to really sit down and think about it. A lot of us don't really. We really don't want that crown. Because that is a, a physical body, a mental abuse. But honestly, think about what Jesus did for you. 39 lashes with a cat of nine tails whip. Beaten, punched, spit on. A crown of thorns shoved on his head. Kicked and, and smacked and put a, a robe over his head and punched in the face. And then carry a big old wooden cross. And nails drove through his hands and his feet. All for us. 
And we have the opportunity to stand up for what is right and suffer what is right for His name's sake. But, don't think that when you get up to heaven and you're standing before Jesus and you're getting these crown, crown after crown after crown. In fact, you're going, like, hey, Peter, will you bring me a little wagon? I'm getting so many crowns here. I got to, I got to carry, I got to carry these things in a wagon or something like that. You know, that you're going to be strutting around heaven, going, that's right, that's what I'm talking about. All right, look at all these crowns I got. You just barely made it into heaven. What you got to talk about? You know, I don't think it's going to be like that. Because the example it is of the in Revelation chapter four is where the twenty four elders. Now I don't know about you, if you're an elder, that means you have gone through some trials and some learning and some teachings for you to be a leader, to be called an elder of anything, whether it's a church or a group of of, of people in a business. But these twenty four elders bow and take their crowns off and they lay them at the feet of Jesus. Now, I'm going to take up like those wise men because that's why they're elders and I'm going to do the exact same thing because when reality hits what Jesus did for you, you're going to say this piece of gold and all these fine jewelry is, is, it belongs to you because you gave your life to me. Just for me. You died on that cross just for me. I would not be here if it wasn't for you. I want to just take now this time to just kind of look at that. Those are some of the things that we're looking at when you stand before Jesus. But this is going to be like a suggestive timeline of don't write it down in stone. This is what Pastor John said. This is how it's going to happen and get in some dispute or something like that of how the timeline of some things that are going to happen. But this is kind of like a suggestive timeline of some things that, that how I, I kind of maybe perceive it, some others perceive it, that these things are going to happen in the end. Okay? First is going to be Christ's return. That means not return as in coming to the earth. He's going to come through the clouds. You know, there's going to be the big shout of the angel. And then there's going to be the dead in Christ will rise first. Those that follow Jesus, you know, from the time of his death, anybody that followed Jesus for, for 2,000 some years will come out of the grave or out of the sea or their dust, you know, wherever their dust are scattered when they were, were cremated or blowed up or whatever, all that. They're going to come up first. Then... The Christians that are alive are going to be raptured up behind them. Then there's going to be the believer's reward. This is what we just talked about. Then there's the seven, tribu the seven years of tribulation. The second three and a half years of the tribulation are going to be way worse than the first. And some, this is where the seven, seven years of tribulation, some people are saying we're going to be raptured up before that. That's the pre-trib believers. You know, again, you know, we're going to just say I'm a pan-trib believer. You know, it'll all pan out. I'm going to heaven one way or another. I'm going. You know? But it's the idea that the tribulation will happen. Seven years of, of, of God, Jesus' wrath and God's wrath are going to come down. Then there's going to be the battle of Armageddon. That's going to be a bad time. That's when Jesus comes back and he's going to be fighting uh, the, the Antichrist and the beast. And, and then, then there's Satan is thrown into the bottomless pit. And then Christ, after all of that's done, Christ will be on earth and he will reign for a thousand years. And then there will be the great white throne judgment. So what will, it, what, will, what will heaven be like for us? I mean, the idea of saying we're going to go to heaven, you know, a lot of people get this picture in their mind that when we get to heaven, it's going to be so boring up there. You know, you're going to look around them little fat naked babies playing the little harps going with their little wings out their side there, playing the little harps, you know. I, I don't think heaven's going to be like that. I really don't. I, I really think that, 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 that 
John puts a picture in Revelations, Revelations 21, that he's going to really establish what a picture of heaven is going to be like for us when we get there. So God will establish, he's going to establish a new heaven and a new earth. Can we, can we get that in that mind? What we see here is no longer going to be in existence because Jesus and God are going to make a new earth. Because again, they made everything in six days anyways, from the very beginning. How quickly they can make everything over, you know, can be a new TV show, reality show, Jesus and God, you know, Earth Makeover. Woo -woo, you know, I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, somebody got that live. You know, here we go. It's the idea. In Revelations 21.1, it says this. Revelations 21.1. It says, And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There's my proof of it right there. God and Jesus ain't playing. They're starting from scratch. They're starting it all over. We're going to knock it down. We're going to start all over. You know, so some of them make over homes. You know, they think they, keep, they go in there and fix it all up. But some of them homes, they just say, get the bulldozer, take it down. You know? And so here it is. We're going to look at that, that, that Jesus is coming again. And when He rules and He reigns, He's starting it all afresh and anew. There's going to be, there's going to be the idea that there's no more, there's no more suffering. You know, there, there will never be suffering again. The things that we go through now in life of people dying of cancer, babies dying, adults dying, children dying, car wrecks, you know, it, it, the, the pain of having headaches and, 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 and heart problems and, and arthritis problems, you know, all that stuff, all that suffering is going to be no more. Here it is in Revelation 21, verses 4 and 5. It says, he will wipe every tear from their eye. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order, get that, the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Have you ever been into like a brand new house and kind of walked in there and everything just got built and it's all cleaned after the, the construction leave, you know, guys leave and they have the, the special cleaners, you know, come in there and wipe all the dust and everything down and, it, and, it's, just, and it's just like, man, this is a nice place. I'd like to live here. You know, I'd like to buy that. That's what it's going to be like here on earth. You know, God is going to clean house. He's going to have His special cleaners come in there and just absolutely, you know, vacuum up all the nastiness up there. You know, and, and it's the thought of there's going to be no more, there's going to be no more pain. No more depression. No more loneliness. No more. It's the, it's the think of of having that that waking up in that morning, going, "Oh my goodness, my back is killing me." You know what? There's no more of that. I mean, could you imagine being able to, you know, a new again? The things like Earth here, but it's going to be new. I mean, I'm going to be like, you know, woo I love to do this kind of stuff here. The same things that you liked to do on the old earth. You're going to probably say, well, that was no, that was corny. I ain't doing that no more, but I'm going to do this. This is fun because it's all new and refreshing. It, it, it's no more earthquakes, hurricanes, devastation. Nobody coming into the school or into the government, you know, post office is shooting up. You know, it, it's the idea that there's going to be a, a new world. So there will be an end to the old world because God is going to create a new one. You will live with God forever. Woo! Interesting. Because the intent of God looking in Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden, He wanted to be with them. So He's saying He will want, He's going to. He's going to live with us. See, in, in Revelations, He said 20 times, 20 times, I and, and and I heard a loud voice from the throne of heaven. So we're going to read Re Revelation 21:3. And this is the 20th time he says this part right here. It says I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, "Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. Then will he his people and God himself with will be with them." And He be their God. 
The whole intent of the, uh, uh, be, from the very beginning is that God wanted to make a group of people and He wanted to make them His people, that they would be His God and He would be their God and, and, it, and, and they would be able to go through life together. He wanted to have a relationship. But then man made choices to go against Him. But now through the sifting of time and the things of, of life, he's going to find out who really loves him back because he loved them first and he's going to make himself, he's going to make them their, their, his people. Now how many of you would like that, that, to say, that's my God? How would you like to be just boast around? You know, it's like, you know, could you imagine the arguments then in heaven or on the new earth? That's my God. Oh no, it ain't. That's my God. I'm older than you because you. I was here first. So he my God first. You know, I like, like no, oh no. I like John. John was always he was always doing that with Peter. Probably messing with Peter all the time with Jesus. You know, when he writes in his writing, he goes John. I, I am. This is this is his favorite. Jesus is talking about. He's always considering that I am Jesus's favorite. You know, he, he's always said it, I, it, it's kind of cool because I've seen this in reality. You know, where one person will get into a relationship you know and, and they'll, they'll really kind of pull the favoritism and, well I'm you know I'm your daughter but I'm your favorite you know <laughs> you know I, I'm just saying I'm just it just it said that you know and that's where John is doing the same thing but the idea is that 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 he wants to be our God and we want to be his people and we will call on him on that no one will look at God and live. But see, that was back in Moses' day. And this time here, God's going to walk with us through life. But in all of this, I run across this one problem. Everywhere we go, people have this misconception or this thought that heaven is the default place where we're all going to end our life up at. You know, it's kind of like the old story of, uh, you know, you might run across some people and you've been to the funeral or you've been to over so-and-so's house and somebody just passed away. We're going to use this guy, Uncle Joe, you know. Oh, Uncle Joe, he was a good man. Yeah, but don't mention about that one time in his life. That was a bad time in his life. But yeah, he's in a better place right now. Yes, he's gone on. Yeah, and he's there. And we absolutely fall into that because here's the truth of the matter is, is we don't want to stand there and bring in the reality of that we got to stand before a holy God and be judged on whether we have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And also as a person, I do not want to deliver the bad news and saying to that person who is going through their grieving time of life right now because they lost their loved one of saying, did they know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? Because honestly, if they didn't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they're not in a better place. That is a, that is a, a horrible thing to say, but it's the truth. And to be real about it. Because what the reality is, is, is that heaven is not the default after death. If man was left alone, we lived our life, and we died, we would go to Hell, not heaven. Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14, it reads this. It says, Enter through the narrow gates, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many, many, many will enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life. And only a few will. Find it. The default place, if man is left alone, is hell. And many will go there. The sad thing about it is a lot of good people will die thinking they're okay and will go to hell. People that give and love on people. People that give their money and resources to help people. People that absolutely have a kind heart. Have nothing ill to say about anyone. Those people, if they do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, will not go to heaven. The default of after this life, when your life ends, is hell. 
Broad is the gate to destruction. Destruction is hell. So, after that, for those that do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the final judgment or the second judgment will be the great white throne judgment. For some people, their end will be here. And in this, Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 and 12, pretty much sums it right up of what's going to happen there. It says, Then I saw a great, saw a great white throne, and Him who, who was seated on it, earth and sky fled from His presence. Imagine that. He's so magnificent that the, 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 the earth and sky fled from Him, from His presence. And there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small. Get that. Great and small. That means kings and beggars. That's from the high end of, of mankind to the low end of mankind. Standing before the throne... And a book, the, and, and books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Get that. This is the truth of all those that didn't have never accepted Jesus and asked forgiveness of their sins to be born again. This is where you or they will go and be judged when you die. Because in Hebrews it says, it's appointed unto men once to die, and then you will be judged. As a Christian, you will be judged what you did with Jesus while you lived here on earth. As a non-Christian, you will be judged on your works and if you accepted Jesus Christ, if your name is written in the book. And then in that finding, your name is not written in that book, you will be sent to the lake of fire. Well, that's not fair! Well, don't you get it by now? Life's not fair. It's not fair that Jesus Christ was in heaven, sitting beside God, His Father, living in an awesome place, said, you know what, I'm going to go down to earth and help these people out a little bit. I'm going to go down and live a life, and I'm going to live the life that it is like in heaven, as holy and sinless. And he lives his life for 33 years and then all of a sudden he gets, he gets judged for nothing he did wrong. And then he gets sentenced for nothing he did wrong. And then he gets beaten for nothing he did wrong. And then he gets crucified for nothing he did wrong for you. Do you think that's fair? He took the punishment that you deserve. You deserve to be punished. You deserve to be beaten for the, the lie you told when you was 10 years old. The things you stole when you was 13 years old. The, the things that you've done against your mom and dad and disobeying and bringing up and, and putting other gods before God Jehovah and just bringing down the Ten Commandments and laying them before you and saying, you deserve the beating and the death on the cross. Was it fair for Jesus to die in your place? No, it wasn't fair. So it's not, the, the idea is the same, is that it doesn't matter that it's not fair, is that Jesus is right now giving grace and mercy and a chance for you to say, I accept Him and I want Him and I want to go to heaven and I want to be a part of His family because one day I want to walk with Him. I want to be able to talk to Him. I want for Him to talk to me. I want for Him to love me for real in this new heaven and this new earth. But it's the idea of it's your choice of what you're going to do here and your time at your walking this earth. It's the idea of thinking that, that is, do you think it's fair that this guy is walking down the street and all of a sudden he gets a notion in his head and goes over to this woman and he mugs her and he rapes her and he beats her and then all of a sudden he stands before the judge and the judge says, I didn't see, she deserved it, what she was wearing. I find you not guilty, you can go. Do you think that's fair? That's not fair. 
It's the same thing that we're doing right now with our life is that we're saying, I'm going to live life my way. Jesus died on the cross for me. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's great. I accept Him as Lord and Savior. And we're still living like we were when we weren't saved. Jesus did all of this for us to have this new life, this new heaven, this new earth on the other end of all of this. So what are you going to do when it comes to your end? Because the end, you don't know when your end is. What are you going to do? For some, it's to accept Him as Lord and Savior. For the others, it's to give up this world and what's happening in this world and give up that way of life and totally sell out for Jesus. You're dibbling and dabbling on both sides of it because you know, well, you know, I'm just... I, I, I've been in this part of the Christian side over here, but this looks like fun. I'm going to go check this out. You know, I'm going to be a part of that. You know, but God's saying, I don't like that. I mean, it's the idea uh, is that He's your dad, and your dad's looking you at the face and saying, "Listen, I love you, and what you're doing is wrong. It's it's a sin against me and my household." And I'm asking you to stop it. And if you don't stop it, you're going to have to pay the consequences of it. And I don't want you to pay the consequences of it. But it's your choice. I love you. So as we close, if you bow your heads. We all are going to come to the end of our life. You have a choice. Accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and follow Him and give your life to Him. And stand before Him and receive the, the, the honors that He will give you for living a life following Him. And then seeing how magnificent He is and laying what He gives you back at the throne and saying, hey, listen, I, I couldn't do this if it wasn't for you in the first place. You can keep it. I'm just glad you did what you did for me. But then there's some of us that we just, we're just, we got salvation and that's how we're living. And Jesus is calling us out. Listen, I made you for a purpose. I want you to be able to spread my love and tell people that I love them because I want to give you this crown. But it's just like getting ready. You got to get involved to do that. Today is a day that I'm asking you to make a choice before your end comes. Will you make a choice right now? If you don't know Him as Lord and Savior, will you ask Him to forgive you of your sins and ask Him to save you and baptize you with the Holy Spirit? And for those that are following Him, will you get off of that lukewarmness and, and will you get on fire and seek what He made you for. Because there's people around you who are going to die and the default place when they die is hell. And you might be the only link to make that not happen. So as we pray, will you ask God to get involved in your life? Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus to thank you for this day. We thank you for your love. We thank you for Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for what you did for us. We thank you for coming and dying and, and being raised from the dead to forgive us of our sins. Please forgive us of our sins and Holy Spirit baptize us. Make us a part of God's family. That we will one day be a part of the new heaven and the new earth. And that you, O oh God, will walk with us and we'll get to have a conversation with you. Be like us being down here on earth and getting to talk to a superstar or a, a really famous musician or something like that. But you'll be better. You're God. And we'll be able to walk with you and, and listen to you talk and talk back to you. How, how just to even think about that is amazing. So God, we just give you the honor and glory and ask you, Holy Spirit, now convict those of the direction that they need to go. For those that don't, that, that they're just they're so undecided, God, tonight, God, tonight I ask you, don't let them rest until they make a decision. And I pray for their salvation. Save them. God, save them. 
We love you and we thank you for loving us first. I bless these people and those even watch online. I bless them in the name of Jesus. That you will reveal them with your love. I bless them with your love. And I bless them with your peace and your joy. God, go and be God in their life right now. In Jesus' name, amen.